We want to welcome everybody to Lighthouse Fellowship Church, those that are live streaming with us, and we hope that you all had a good Christmas, <clears throat> and uh, I know we did. We had a good family gathering, and people that were able to uh, come to the Christmas Eve service, and we had a pretty good turnout for the Christmas Eve service, so those of you that couldn't make it, I'm sorry that you couldn't, but you'll have another opportunity next year, Lord willing. I haven't... I haven't missed too many of them except for the pandemic when we were shut down for that a while back. But uh, <clears throat> we want to uh, say that we all will also have um, the New Year's Eve service coming up, 9 to midnight, and we'll have goodies to snack on, and we'll also have uh, a circle of prayer right as midnight strikes, and uh, we'll pray for a few minutes together. And just to welcome in the new year. So we hope that you can be a part of that. We'll try to live stream that for those of you that uh, are not able to make it in person. But hope that most of you can. And we'll, we'll be looking forward to that. Now <clears throat> we'll turn to a song. A Christmas song. And I know you're still in the Christmas spirit. And uh, I know that you're thinking of the new year and making those promises to yourself that you want to do things differently, <clears throat> as all of us do. Let's turn to page 83, and let's stand together, <clears throat> and we'll sing page uh, 83 with Hark the Herald, Angels Sing. Those of you that are live streaming with us, just go right ahead and turn to that too. Here we go. Hark the Herald, Angels Sing, Glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. We're going to sing a verse of each of several. <clears throat> now page 85, O little town of Bethlehem. Verse, first verse. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lying above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Now it came upon a midnight clear, page 86. It came upon the midnight clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, good will to men from heaven's all gracious King, the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. <clears throat> now we'll sing Joy to the World, the uh, first verse of that one, and then we'll let you sit back down. Here we go. Page 88 in your hymnal. <clears throat> Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. 
Christmas. We thank you, Father, because we know the real meaning. Most of us here do, and most of those that are live streaming, they know uh, what the meaning of Christmas is, Lord. It's all about your Son. It's about the salvation that you were able to bring through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, that, Father, he was born as a babe in a manger. Emmanuel, God with us, is his name. And, Father, we thank you that Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, uh, was get born to, to be our sacrifice, a price we could not pay, and but he could. And so, Father, we just pray that you'd help us to understand and to know that this is truly a wonderful season. When salvation came to mankind that had been prophesied for years, thousands of years, but then he came as a babe in the manger in Bethlehem. And, Father, we are thankful that we can have that salvation and look forward to heaven because we know, Lord, this world is not perfect. This world is not our home because we are in the world, as Paul said, but we are not of the world. We're aliens and strangers here. And as Abraham said, pilgrims. And so we're just passing through. So we thank you, Father, that we can remember the meaning of Christmas and that we were able to celebrate together with our families, most of us, and, Father, that now we're here together today celebrating some still and thinking about the new year. And we pray for the blessings upon each one that's here, Father, your blessings, your Holy Spirit, to touch us in a way that we need touched, that you would help us to be able to consider your word as we think about our own lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated now, and I just want to welcome, of course, they're not strangers here, they're just some of us. Uh, Jim and Linda Moyer and Velma, we're so glad to have them uh, back over to our church today. And we hope that you had a good Christmas, and Cammie too, Cammie Jr. too. And then I'd like to introduce you to Carlene's sisters, Sylvia and Rini. And we're glad that they're with us. They're staying to help Carlene out. Goodness knows I'm not much help sometimes. But boy, you'd be surprised how much they can get done. It's amazing how women can get things done when they get together, Right? It's amazing. And uh, I don't know. It just seems like they know what Carlene's thinking. And sometimes I get it wrong. Can you believe that? I don't know how I do it. Sometimes I'm not thinking like she's thinking, even though all these years. And then she'll say something to the girls, and they'll know right where she's coming from. I don't understand it at all. But anyway, 42 years, I would think I would know her. And pretty soon you start looking like each other, my grandfather said. Right? You start looking like me, Carlene? No, okay, she won't agree with that. But anyway, <clears throat> now, it's too bad, Katie, you don't have a special song this morning, do you? Ooh, I've got that with Bluetooth that's right in the office. That yeah, thing works good for that karaoke music right from your phone, so there's no excuse anymore, right? Uh, well, we'll now turn to God's Word, and remember, uh, we will be, I don't want to forget tithes, because uh, Sammy, our treasurer, would have a heart attack if I forgot to take up tithes and offerings. And that has happened, believe it or not. So, But we, we want to think about uh, the new year coming up, and, and she will let you know more about that uh, next Sunday, about what to do if you're filing taxes and you need some verification of your charitable giving. Now, <clears throat> we have a verse I'm going to share with you. Several verses, actually. There it is. <clears throat> okay, Philippians. And chapter 3 of Philippians. <clears throat> now, as we're looking at Philippians, I want you to think back to some Christmases you've had in the past. Christmases. And they can be so much fun. We've got some of them on video. And I put a family video on last night, and I know some people were bored to tears. You know how that's how it is. You know, oh, no, another family video. But uh, home videos, uh, but they are fun. You get to look back and see, wait a minute, when I, was, when I was that old, I had darker hair, you know. And I might have been in better shape. 
And of course, of course parlay was pretty any time, every time, so it didn't matter there. But we got to see Syl Sylvia, and uh, their family came over to our house there in Sydney, and and uh, she brought the pumpkin pies that she she forgot to put sugar in, and she did put it on top though. Does that count? Does that count when you put the sugar on top? Does it taste the same? Okay, I don't know. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. And we we had this family get together, and we had a lot of a lot of fun. And but we think about that. We think about. The, the days gone by. Did you know God's word says that life, uh, life is just like a, let's see. A what? Life is like a vapor. Yeah, there you go. James chapter 4. Thank you, Sylvia. The Sunday school teacher telling me. Uh, life is like a vapor. And, and it, it's, uh, it's here and then it vanishes away. Life is like a vapor. So you know that life just seems, I don't know if you realize this, but didn't Christmas go by so fast this year? Right? It just was here and then it was gone. You had your four-day weekend or whatever it was if you're working, and it's gone, right? Did you get five days? Four days? Okay, so when you get that and it just goes so fast because you're so busy anyway, do you remember those times when you had to go from one family to the other? The in-laws, the outlaws, uh, you know, the, the family, your, whole, your own family, and uh, other other people that were having get together. So, and by the time you do all that and get your Christmas presents bought and give them out and, and all that stuff, man, the whole weekend's gone, right? And now you need a vacation to rest. And while you're having that Christmas break, you're waiting for school to start back, right? And you can't wait. And somebody got your kid bat something that takes batteries and makes noise. You know what I, mean? I don't know if I did that to Rachel and Mike this year or not, but it's fun when you do that. <laughs> you wonder, you wait and see, how long will it be before they take it away? <laughs> oh, it's funny. But we think back about Christmas and the year that's passed, and the, the year culminates in Christmas, when it comes together and we celebrate what life really is all about, what living should be all about. So we think about that, and it's a wonderful time. But now, as we look to the coming year, I want you to think about some things with me here out of Philippians. And we're going to look at verse 7, and we'll read through a little bit. <clears throat> but what things, this is Paul speaking to the church at Philippi. And the people there at the church of Philippi were called Philippians. And so he writes this letter to them about their church and about Christians and how we should live, including you and I, how we should live and what we should be thinking and, and his experience in life that he, with God that he wants to help us with. So we look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Now let's look back at verse 6 because it, it makes sense if we read a little bit more of this. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Here he's saying he was a blameless man as far as he was concerned. He was zealous. He was really motivated. And he had a, had a, a, a way of thinking that he was okay. He was blameless of doing anything wrong. He knew the law. And, and he was somebody that was really knowledgeable about the law. Hey, Steve, would you do me a favor? Could you, all you have to do is push those spotlights. Just push the button. You don't have to turn them at all because it's a little bit dark up here for me to read. It's not, I'm not getting older. I know that's not what it is. But have you noticed as you get older, it's harder to see at night? Did you notice that? Okay. You know what I'm talking about, Marge, right? Just push each one up. There's four of them. All right. <clears throat> now, Paul says, he talks about how he was circumcised on the eighth day in verse 5. He talks about uh, he had confidence in the flesh. And if any man had any reason to think he had uh, a reason to trust in the flesh, it was him in verse 4. And in verse 3 it says, and for we were are the circumcision. He was a circumcision. He's, part, he's a Jew. He was one that was a Jew. And uh, he worshiped God in the spirit, he says, and, and rejoiced in Christ Jesus. He was saying, that, now he wasn't doing that at the time, but he was a Jew and he was very proud of it. 
He was a, a Roman citizen, and he was proud of that. And the Romans actually got him to go ahead, and they gave him a band of soldiers, and he had to go around, and he had to arrest Christians. And this is before he was saved, when he was still named Saul, when he was still called Saul. And with a band of, of soldiers, he would take them around and arrest Christians. Because as far as the Jews were concerned, they didn't want to accept Jesus Christ. And so anybody that was uh, worshiping Jesus Christ, they wanted them arrested. They wanted them put in jail if they could. Or they would have them stoned and left to die. And Paul, if you remember, in one of the writings of Paul, he said he had the people, well, in Acts, uh, Luke was writing this. And I, it could have been Paul that was uh, dictating it, but we don't know. But Luke was writing it, uh, and it was Acts, talking about the history of the church and how Saul, before he was saved, uh, uh, he, the people, the Jewish people that were against the Christians that were in, in the area, they were piling their coats at Paul's feet. And because Paul was the authority on the scene to supervise the stoning. So they were going to stone some Christians. They gave him their coats to watch over. You know, clothing was pretty expensive back then to just to have clothing, especially colored clothing. The clothing that had any color to it, it was hard to come by. So they were giving their, them to, to Paul to watch over there. And then they went ahead and stoned. So you, you think about this. This is, this is bad. He was a part of all this. And there's no telling how many Christians he, he was persecuting he had persecuted and how many had stood by and supervised the stoning of or the torture of or the arrest of and they'd take them back to the, the Roman government and have them tried and then stoned or killed or put in with the wild animals and lions and so on. Did this happen? Absolutely it happened. Could it ever get that bad with Christians today? It's already that bad in some places out of the United States. And per Christians are being persecuted in America today in some ways. So, hey, uh, would you push that button on this microphone? I'm just not coming together real good on all these little simple things that everybody else does. We've got some people on vacation, so I'm missing a few things here. And uh, some that are sick. Pray for James, uh, our videographer, video, uh, videographer, videographer. <laughs> That uh, normally does it for us, and his wife Kate is doing it for us. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and so, yes, I need some water. Thank you, Carly. <clears throat> She's she knows my voice. Can you believe she knows me better than I know myself? That's why I follow her around at the buffet, see what she gets, <laughs> because I know it's going to be something on her plate that I'm going to be wanting. Yeah, that's what I like to sit next to me because of that reason. She'll do that elbow thing that the convicts do. Don't get my food. But anyway, <clears throat> oh, that's better. No, she loves to sit. She loves to sit by me. She just wants me to stay in my own play. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> you can see Paul had a real good reason to feel guilty about a lot of things when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he said, Saul, Saul, Jesus, when he met him in blinding light, he saw Jesus and uh, fell on his knees and was blinded. And, and uh, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why kickest thou against the pricks? And he was saying, why are you persecuting me? Me, Jesus said. So when we're persecuting the church, when we're troubled for the church, we're persecuting Christ. Did you know that? Because he's coming back for the church. He's the bride, uh, he's the groom, and we are the bridegroom, but the bride of Christ. So when he comes back, he's coming after the church. So these people that say, I don't have to be part of the church, who's Jesus coming back for? The church. Where does he expect us to be in our lives? In church. In fact, God's word says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, 
Now I know it's time, it's a time of live streaming and, and online TV evangelists and all that. But God's word didn't say we should pile two or three TVs around us and have fellowship with the TVs. No, instead it says we should fellowship together. So it's kind of hard to get fellowship from the TVs. Though we get blessed from the TVs, I'm sure. And we get a wonderful sermon many times. And it makes us regular pastors look kind of bad when some of these TV evangelists preach so well. But the fact is, God has us here for people that he's given us. Congregation as a shepherd over a flock of people. And we should do our job so that these people that God gives us can be blessed. So when we think about this, Paul was told by Jesus Christ, why are you kicking against the church? Why are you persecuting the truth? And when he was saying, you're, you're, you're kicking against the prick, and the prick is what you put, that's, that's why they use those things on the back of their cowboy boots, spurs. That's why they kick the horses with spurs. And that's why they use things to prick animals with, you know, because they wanted them to move. And he said, you're just kicking against, you're motivated, sure, you're motivated, but you're kicking against something that's very sharp. You're not going to win when you're kicking against the church. And he was telling Paul that. He said, you're kicking against something that's going to hurt you. Yes. So if you've got an idea that you don't need Jesus Christ and, and you don't need a church, this I'm talking to live stream, so I'm, I know I'm not talking to some of you as far as what this means. Because you're here because you know you need God and you know you need Christ. But some of you out there may be listening and listen, you can find something wrong with any church. But when you find something wrong with Jesus Christ, which is what the church is about, you better, get, you better find the way to have fellowship with Jesus Christ and his people. Don't be down on the church and don't beat the church up and, and don't have the pastor for lunch. You know, all these things, God is doing some things and you and I need to make sure that we are not harming the church. Did you know you can harm the church by the way you act toward God and Jesus Christ and the church in front of your kids? Oh, I don't need the church. Mom and Dad did all right. They didn't go to church. They raised me good and all this stuff. You can have all kinds of excuses. But like Jesus said to Saul, you're kicking against something that's sharp and you're not going to win. You know, this is something you shouldn't do. You know, you're persecuting the church and all you're really doing is is hurting yourself and your children and those who are listening to you. And if you don't have it, if you haven't noticed in the workplace today, which they don't want to talk about Jesus at all, or even God, in the workplace today, they do not encourage church worship. Did you notice that? In fact, they'll schedule you to work on Sunday if they can, sometimes. And the holidays and Christmas. Some of you are fortunate to get Christmas off, right? And goodness knows, Thanksgiving, when we're thanking God for everything we've had, they've started doing that Black Friday, and then they started doing Black Thursday. Remember? I don't know if they had Black Thursday this year. Uh, probably not. The pandemic slowed things down a little bit. But some of you are not old enough to remember. Steve might be. I don't know. March, maybe. I'm not saying anything about your age. I'm just saying... The blue law. How many know what the blue law is? Raise your hand. What? Okay, maybe you didn't have it around here. But in my area, we had what was called the blue law. Down south, they had the blue law, and it lasted longer, you know, before, the longer they did up north. The blue law is when everything is closed on Sunday. They used to do that, believe it or not. Did you, anybody ever hear that? Any of you hear of it? Okay. Good. Good. And they closed everything. And they they did they rotated which gas station could be open in case people had emergencies and they needed to go somewhere. Because even gas stations were closed except one. And then they would they would rotate that one. And when it was their turn, they'd take their turn. So you see, what did that do? It caused people to have more opportunity to go to church. And it caused them not to have work as a reason or as an excuse to miss church. And it caused the employers to say, 
You know what? The blue laws in effect, I can't make them work Sunday. If we don't get it done by before the weekend, hey, guess what? It don't get done. Saturday, we have to come in half a day or whatever. We can see that. But Sunday, forget it. Get it done. So here we go. Jesus was having this discussion on the road to Damascus. Paul, why was Paul heading to Damascus? And what did he have in his hand? I'm going to ask you, what did Paul or Saul at the time have in his hand when he was going toward Damascus? He had a handful of something. Absolute uh, papers to arrest Christians, warrants for the arrest of Christians. He had that handful of warrants. He was on his way to arrest Christians in Damascus. And on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus Christ. And he got from Jesus Christ information. And the information was go down to Damascus, a street called Straight. And see Ananias, because Saul was blinded from that great light that Jesus Christ was emitting. And when he was blinded, he had to be led to Damascus. Can you imagine that? A leader of men like he was, somebody that was in charge, the authority, and all of a sudden he can't even see. And so when we think of this, we have to know that Saul was humbled. He was humbled. And so he was led to Damascus. Ananias told him about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he needed to do. His life was changed. He got straightened out on a street called Straight. The cute. Now, when you think of this, Saul, Saul was really out there. Have you met people that you said, man, they're way out there. They think anything's right. They'll go to any church. They'll listen to anybody. They'll look at anything on the internet and think it's the truth. How many of you know a few people like that? Oh, yeah. I, 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 uh, you know, sometimes people on the internet, or internet are wrong. Did you know that? Sometimes they're wrong. Did you know sometimes they even exaggerate? Oh, yeah. You know what? Did you know sometimes they make things up? I don't know why they do that kind of stuff. Isn't that right, Jim? Sometimes people on the internet make things up. Yeah, they do. And so when you think about this, you think about all the things that Paul was going through Paul's mind when he was still Saul. God changed his name. He got straightened out on, on the, in Damascus there. And when he got straightened out, God, he, he three years, God had told him to pull aside for three years and God began to teach him the word, give him the word. And he told him his mission was to the Gentile people. Gentile people are what? Somebody tell me. Huh? Anybody that's not a Jew is called a Gentile. Right away you see that those Jewish people had a tendency to think less of other people. If you're not a Jew, you're something else. See what I mean? But, but, but you and I will say that about people too sometimes. Not the Jewish thing, but because after all, Jesus was a Jew, so lay off. Right? We just Did you know there are Messianic, Messianic Jews? They believe uh, in the Messiah, and they believe that Jesus Christ did come, and that he is the way of salvation. Messianic Jews, and that's wonderful when you meet them, because, man, they, they know the scriptures that brought the prophecies that told about Jesus coming. They listened. Even the wise men sought Jesus Christ, didn't they? They came from the east. And they, they sought Jesus Christ because they had seen his star in the sky. And of course, the star that led Mary and Joseph, you know, I mean, over Bethlehem. Of course, they knew where Bethlehem was. That was their hometown, both of them. And so the place where they were supposed to go to be taxed. You know how the IRS is. They had the IRS back then, too. They want everybody to account for themselves so they can not miss anybody when it comes to tax time. I hate that word. Oh, look at it. Maybe you don't. But it's good now. I don't have to worry too much about it because how many of you know what a fixed income is? Okay. There you go. So taxes get a whole lot simpler, supposedly, now as we move that direction.
direction. But when we think about the IRS that they had, their own IRS there in that time period, under the Roman government, they weren't going to miss anybody. Isn't it amazing how God used something like that to get Mary and Joseph right back to the town they needed to go to to have Jesus, to have him born in that manger, where there was no room for him in the end. So, but we're looking at this, we're seeing that the Roman government had a lot of power, and here was Paul, and he was kicking against the Jewish people uh, that were wanting to believe in Jesus. Anybody, any Christians that were wanting to believe in Jesus, he was on a mission, and his mission before he accepted the Lord was to kill them, or to arrest them, or torture them, put them in jail. These are the things he was doing. So let's look now at his life. Now, how many of you might have regrets in life? Can I see your hands? How many of you have a few regrets? Well, man, that's about everybody here. So when you think about regrets, we all have regrets. And did you know some people don't accept Jesus Christ because they think they're too bad to be saved? How many of you, did, you, did uh, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, did Satan tell you, you're too bad to be saved. How many did he say that to? Some of you didn't know you were so bad that you, you know, I'm not just teasing. Let me see your hands again. How many of you thought, because Satan told you, you're too bad to be saved. Did you leave your hands up a minute? I don't want to just kind of look around. Well, some of you thought you were pretty good after all. Or some of you maybe were raised better than some of us because I don't know about you, but I got into a little bit of trouble every once in a while. Carlene was hiding a cigarette before we were dating. It was when she was in the teens. And she was hiding it behind her back because her father was coming toward her. And she dropped it so he wouldn't see what she was doing and kept setting the field on fire. Oh, yeah, it was burning. Yeah. How, how long did... I'm sure he put it out for you, didn't he? Huh? It was just one cabbage plant. Just a what? One cabbage plant. Was driving. One cabbage plant. Boy. It was in the fall. That hateful cabbage plant. <laughs> it got you in big trouble. <laughs> uh, and so she had a few regrets. You might have too. A few regrets from the past. So when we think about life, we all have regrets. And if you're like me, Satan said that same phrase to you. What do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? You're too bad to be saved. Some of you were told. Now some of you were raised pretty good and you didn't get into much trouble. And so, did you know that some people that think that they're not so bad might be harder for them to get them saved than those that know they've been bad? Did you know that? So, those, I want to help you here a little bit. Those of you that were like me, find it in your heart that when you had some things you're not proud of before you got saved, find some people that might be struggling with thinking they're too bad to be saved. You help them out. Help them to know that God loves them too. That Jesus came for them too. And those of you that were raised so that you didn't get into much trouble, and I saw a few that didn't raise your hands about uh, being mean and sinful or whatever, didn't get into much trouble, those of you help those that think they're already too good and they don't need to be saved. Because maybe that was what Satan was telling you. You're, you haven't done much wrong. You don't need to be saved. You were raised good. You know, you're as good as the next person. Wait a minute. Did he use that on anybody? Let's see your hands. Aha. Yeah, see? Some of you. There. See, see, Satan will, and he was doing this thing about, you're too bad to be saved. The day I was saved, Satan was working on me with that. He said, why don't you come to the altar for? You're too bad to be saved. You, you, you'll never, and then he said, You'll never be able to live it. He told me that too. Man alive. What hope do I have? And I talked to the associate pastor who happened to be preaching that day. And he said, you know what? Jesus died for people like you. Like you and me. He died for us. Even though we were sinners. Christ died for us. I thought, wow. There is hope. I can be saved. It was neat. And I accepted the Lord as my Savior. And I remember going out of the church that morning just feeling, wow, I'm clean for the first time in my life. I, I, feel, I feel the Lord in my heart. And you know what? When we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, 
Jesus moves into our heart through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts, seals us until the day of redemption is what God's Word says. We're convicted by the Holy Spirit. We're drawn. No man can come to the Father except through the Holy Spirit. He draws us to God. And then we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We've got to remember that. The Holy Spirit has a lot to do with it. So Jesus moves into our heart. The Holy Spirit is now within our hearts to help can show us how to live. Now, the thing is, is that when, when Jesus is there in our hearts, now we have help knowing how to live. And then when we accept it, I remember that day I walked out of the church with my girlfriend, walked out of the church, and it wasn't her name. It was a, a preacher's daughter, a preacher's daughter. And, uh, and I remember she and her mom was going at it. They were arguing, arguing. And then some, she was saying bad things. Her mom was saying bad things to her. And I thought, and in my heart, being saved with a new heart, God's Word says He gives us a clean heart. He makes us a new creature. And I looked at the situation. I said, that's okay. They just need the love of God in their hearts right now. That's all that's wrong. They're not feeling God's love. And that's why they're talking like that to each other. See, God gives you a new perspective right away. And you see people that, that are down and out, and, and you know, you want to help them. You see people that are in sin, you want to help them to see the difference now. And they're struggling, and they need a relationship with the Lord, a salvation relationship with the Lord. So, here was Saul heading to Damascus. He gets straightened out there in Damascus on a street called Straight, and Ananias helps him to understand about what Jesus came to do, and then Jesus had given him a mission. To, and for that three years that he studied the word, God showed him his mission. His mission was to bring salvation, to bring Jesus Christ, the gospel, to the Gentile people. And so when you think about this, now Saul, Saul had some regrets. You know he did. Now when he's writing this, you know he had some regrets. Look at this. He was circumcised the eighth day, verse 5, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. If there was ever a Hebrew, he was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, you know. That's like you, you're, you're a, a worker among the workers because you're one of the best. You know, that's how some people feel when they're at work. Hey, I'm one of the best. You know, I, I, I've done all things right. So this is what he said, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, of the stock of Israel. I mean, I'm really a Jew. There's no extra things in my lineage. I'm a Jew. And so, uh, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. He said, I was a Pharisee. And, and, and he said, I knew the word from backwards and forwards. We're talking about the, the Torah, the old law, you know, the Old Testament. He knew it. He knew the prophecies about Jesus. But he had not accepted Jesus. Now, how do, that's what I wonder about. How in the world do they see these prophecies being fulfilled and not accept Jesus? That's why there are Messianic Jews. Because they believed in the Messiah. And they see the truth of it. And there's people out there that are Jewish that are being saved all the time. But as a nation, the Jewish nation has still not proclaimed Jesus Christ as a Savior. That's so sad. But look along and see what he says. Uh, verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness of, of which is in the law, blameless. He's saying, as far as motivation goes, zeal goes, I was motivated. I was so motivated for God that I was persecuting the church. Wow. I hope you're not so motivated for God, you're hurting the church. Or hurting other people. Or hurting his people. You see? And that's what he said. He's, he's admitting this. But at the time, you could, you could tell that when he was lost. He's saying this about when he was lost. When he didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. When it came to zeal, he was proud of it back then. He was, he was able to persecute the church. Drive those Christians out. You know, touching the righteousness which is in the law. He didn't have it. He was living by the letter of the law. What, whatever the law said, he was doing it. Sacrifices and so on. He was doing it. He knew it. He knew the law. But he was lost. There's a lot of people out there that are doing things that they think makes them a Christian, makes them good, makes them go to heaven. But if they're not accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior, they're lost, just like Paul was or Saul at this time. So, 
Now let's look at this. He, he looks at this through the first six verses of Philippians. He sees this. He's remembering his life before Christ. Did you know sometimes we need to remember our life before Christ? So we remember what Christ has brought us out of. So we realize how much he's done for us. So we remember how wonderful it is to know Jesus Christ as our Savior and know how we can live. And we can be pleasing to God and we can do what God's called us to do. You may be in the workplace, but you can still be a witness. Not on company time, of course. <laughs> but during your breaks and during lunch and after work, before work, avoid on company time. You better be careful. They'll fire you for being a God person. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. There are people, they, they have rules some places that you can't talk about Jesus or God. It would be, it's controversial. And they'll send you to HR or to administration and you'll get dinged for it. How many of you know that? Oh yeah. I remember when I came back from college and they wanted to hire me because I'd done every process in the shop. And they wanted to hire me as a supervisor on the second shift because I was a good worker. You know, and they knew it. They knew it. They wanted me to be a supervisor after I'd worked there all the way through the last few years of high school. And then when I came back, I worked through the summers. When I came back, they wanted to hire me as a supervisor on second shift. The first question the manager of the company asked, he says, are you still as excited about God as you were then? Why do you think he asked that? Just because I preached in the lunchroom twice. It was on my time. I just got up on the bench in the, in the lunchroom and preached. Just a short message about James. You know, life is like a vapor appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And some people must have taken offense to that. I don't know why. I just thought they needed to know, hey, you're sitting around here playing cards, talking and cussing and all this stuff. I said, and, it, and it hit me. I, thought, I was reading the Word. I thought, on break time, I thought, man, this is, these people need this here. They need to hear this here. And I, got, and I, I just couldn't stand any longer, so I just got up on, on my bench seat and I said, hey, can I have your attention for a moment? I'd like to tell you about Jesus Christ. You know, He died for you. You know, life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Don't you think you might need to think about Jesus? Ask him in your heart, Professor Mr. Shaker. I got back down and sat down. So, what, what's wrong with that? Came back into my department and they were just huddled together. I came in and went scattered. You think they might be able to talk about me? I wonder. <laughs> and I did it another time too. I couldn't help myself. I knew then, without a doubt, I was called to preach. Believe me, I knew I was called to preach. God had called me. Well, I didn't want to admit it, though. It took me a little while before I admitted it. But I'm just saying, look at Saul here. Paul at this time, right now, he's Paul. God had changed his name and uh, told him that you're now Paul, which is a rock. You know, it's talking about, well, Peter's a rock, but he was a uh, Paul. Petra, Petrus, Peter was wrong. But anyway, Paul was to the Gentiles a steadfast person that was able to help them to understand who Jesus was. Now let's look at this. Now if Paul was real regretful about his previous life, and just like you and I are sometimes, what did he do about it? Did he let that stand in the way of receiving Jesus? No, he accepted Jesus. I mean, he, he knew. See, the Holy Spirit convicts us of what we do wrong. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us, he also draws us to the, to the, Holy, the by the Holy Spirit to the Father. Because no man can say that he is of God except he is drawn by the Holy Spirit. So when he draws us, he shows us what to do about that conviction we're feeling. And then, if we'll just turn to him, he causes us to have the redemption of Jesus Christ through salvation. Now, now let's look and see what Paul's attitude was in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Now, now Paul's attitude is this. Now he sees it as he looks back. Those things that I thought were important to me, that were very important, that were gained to me, that something that was valuable to me, I counted 
loss for Christ. Now, what he was saying here was this. I was living for the wrong things, doing the wrong things. I was living for myself. And none of this stuff made a bit of difference as far as eternity goes, and as far as really being a good person, or none of this. I thought I was doing God a service, but all I was doing was kicking against the pricks, like Jesus told me. Kicking against something sharp, which is the church of God. And since I was doing that, it was a terrible thing. Now he sees how bad it was. Now, but he said, but what things were gained to me back then, I count them lost for Christ. So he says, I wasted time, I wasted that energy, I wasted that effort. It was a great loss when you think about it. Look at it, my time when I wasn't saved, it was a time of loss. Yea, verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He said, yea, I count all things but loss now, except for anything that had to do with the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. See, now that's what his attitude was. If it didn't have anything to do with Christ, it wasn't important to him now. Because he came to know the Lord. He was now had a clean heart. He was a new creature. Anything that was other than what Christ wanted him to do or have in life was meaningless. Isn't that how we feel when we come to know Jesus Christ our Savior? It's me. I want to know God's way. I want to have His direction. And if I'm wasting time with talent or skills and not giving God the credit or glorifying God in it, you know what? I'm wasting time. I'm wasting time. I'm giving my motivation and my zeal to something that is not important, just like Saul was. We need to give ourselves to the Lord. And so he said, I count it all lost now except for the knowledge of the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus, of Christ, Jesus my Lord. Now he's saying, I know now that the excellent thing, the best thing, the most important thing, the most valuable thing, that's why the word excellent is there. Excellency is, re is referring to the perfectness of Christ and what he wants to do in our lives. And so here we can see that Paul knew what the Lord wanted to do in his life. He says, now everything he counts for laws, except for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dumb that I may win Christ. You know what that means right there? It means that everything that he thought was important, he now knows he had to set it aside. Everything that he thought life was about, he had to set it aside. Anything that he was doing that did not include Jesus Christ, he had to get it out of his life. That hate, that anger toward those that were Christians, that that proud stuff that he had going on, a Hebrew of the Hebrew, a Roman citizen of the Roman citizens, all this stuff. Born as a Roman citizen, which is a big thing. You weren't just adopted in as a Roman citizen because you were agreeing to their terms and the constitution. No, he was born a Roman citizen. He was proud of that too. He talks about it several times in God's word. Now, he says, I know that all these things, he said, I suffered loss. How did he suffer loss? It was loss because he realized all these things that he thought were important. It was lost time. It was lost effort. Lost motivation. All this stuff was lost. He didn't need it. And he was able to set it aside because the Lord told him, this is not, this is not what I want you to do. All this stuff, you know, all this, th these things that you thought were important. And the pride. Oh, he had pride. You don't think, if you don't think Paul had pride, you're wrong. You, did you know pride was the original sin? Did you know that? Pride. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They wanted to have knowledge of good and evil. You know, they, they, they wanted to have knowledge that God had. Well, you know, you and I, as we decide, we want to have things and want things our way. There's a lot of pride involved in that. When you want things your way and you don't care about anybody else's circumstances because of it, you, my way or the highway, right? By the way, that's the powerful choleric characteristics. Now, we, some of us, have those powerful choleric characteristics. But if you're put 
in relationship with Christ, they can be a good thing. You know, and as far as motivation, now you don't know. You, it doesn't have to be your way. God has to show us that if we're powerful clerics. He has to show us that. You know what? I know you want to get things done, but slow down and do it my way. See? That's what I'm talking about. Now, Carlina's popular the same way. That's the okay person. She'll say, okay, okay, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'll help you. I'll do this and that. Before you know it, they've got so many fire, uh, kettles in the fire, or pans in the fire. You know, I, and I'm not saying anything bad about you, Carly. You're just so likable. And, and many people that are popular saying, you're wonderful. Everybody wants to be around you. You're the fun person. Now, you're more than just a fun person. You're everything to me. Beautiful, fun, enjoyable. But I don't want to make that mistake of saying just the fun person. You can't think of anything better to say about me than I was fun, that's why you married me? Okay, let me just tell you all these things. Beautiful, fun, energetic, loving, caring. How much more do I have to say? Okay, she says, I'm in trouble after church. She's okay, I just don't want to make the same mistake I've made before. Now, let's look at this. Look, he had reason to be proud. Yes, sometimes we think we have reason to be proud. That gets us in trouble. Let's look at this now. He, he counted all that stuff he laid aside like dumb. Now, I, I've said it before, but I'm going to ask somebody. Tell me what dumb is. Steve, you tell me what dumb is. He knows? Okay. What do you, what do you think? Poo. That's right. Rini says it in a real proper way. Poo. It's poo. That's right. That's what it is. Well, you can even say it in New York if you want to. It's a pile of poo. That's what Paul was saying about everything that amounted to anything in, in his life before Jesus Christ. A pile of poo. That's what he was saying. I don't think I've ever said that in church. I've said poo on you before. But anyway, I've never said a pile of poo. But they, thank you, Reed. I really like that. That's a real good way to say it without insulting too many things. But anyway, so, but uh, I count it as dumb now, he said. A pile of poo. That I may win Christ. He said, I, I, I want to win Christ. I want to do things God's way. I want to do what Christ wants me to do. And so when you're doing that, you have to put some things and you have to suffer loss of things that don't matter. That are not, shouldn't be important. And that's what he did. Verse 9. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So here we can see... He had to do a few things. First, he had to recognize that what was gained is really lost if we're not doing it for the Lord. Secondly, we had to realize that Christ has the best plan. If we'll recognize the excellency of Christ, he's got the best solution for us. Why, would, why are we doing anything else? That's the second thing we need to see. And he wanted to be, third thing is we need to be found in him, like Paul said. Not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is uh, which of, is of God by faith. So if we're going to be, the third thing we need to recognize here, if we're going to be what Christ wants us to be, we have to recognize that we should not be in our own righteousness. We shouldn't think that just because we're doing a few things we want to do that we think are good is not necessarily what God wants in our lives. What living for Christ is like is being able to sacrifice and give away those things that are a problem. You know, put them aside. I'm not saying give everything away in a way that's materialistic uh, and, and then find yourself on a mountain waiting for Jesus Christ to come back in the spaceship. That's not what I'm talking about. There were some Christians that did that, you know. They, they were told to give everything away. Jesus is coming back on a certain day and let's wait up on that mountain. He's coming in a spaceship. Do you see how goofy some people can be? How out of God's word, they're not familiar with it. They don't know enough to know when people are wrong. If, let, me, let me just say, if Jesus himself says he doesn't know the time or the hour when he's coming back, only God, not even the angels in heaven, you can be sure that no person can tell you when Jesus is coming back. That's the way it is. So he says he's coming back as a thief in the night. When we think everything's getting okay, or maybe you know, things aren't so bad, and, and it, things are looking like he's coming, and we're gonna, and he says, "Look, watch for such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh." But you and I cannot determine the exact day. We should be watching, though. But he's coming back as a thief in the night. Why as a thief? Because if you knew when a thief was coming, you'd be there to stop him. 
right? You'd be there. You'd be prepared to let that, to show that thief that he can't come into your home. Well, what, what he's saying by that is he's coming back and he's going to surprise us. It's going to be a surprise. But we should be watching because when he comes back, he's going to split the eastern sky as lightning shines from the east and even to the west. The word says he'll come back. And all eyes will behold him, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So if you think that you're not going to ever profess Jesus, you're never going to bow down to profess Jesus as your Savior, you're wrong. But if you don't do it voluntarily before he comes back, it's too late. Then they'll, yes, they will confess Jesus, they will bow down and recognize that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. But if they haven't done it before he comes back, it's too late. That's why you need to listen. And that's why you need to do it. Listen to what God's telling you in your heart and in the Word. Now, and those same people that will do it when it's too late, they'll cry for the rocks to fall upon them. Why? Because they'll be ashamed. They won't want to see the face of Jesus. They won't want to face the judgment that, that they're going to feel and know because Jesus is coming back. They'll know that they're lost. Now... <clears throat> I said all that to say this. We need to be found in Him, doing what God wants us to do. And fourth, that, you may, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings may be made conformable unto His death. Then Paul is saying, I, I want to know Him, the power of His resurrection. It's in other words, some of us have no power because we're not turning to Christ and saying, Lord, help me to have the power to do what I need to do. Help me to have the energy, the strength to do what I need to do. Let's put it that way. The strength to do what we need to do. And goodness knows we don't have it in ourselves. I've gone to doing wall push-ups now because the regular push-ups on the floor are too hard for me. Now, don't make fun of me. But hey, a little bit of something is better than nothing, right? Pearlene's doing this. I don't know what she's saying. She's probably saying you need to go back to the floor push-ups. Well, that'll make a big difference, right? But anyway, I'm just saying, if you and I are, con are continuing to think that we've got the strength to do things, we're missing it by that much. We're missing it, and we always will be. Because if we do things in our own strength, instead of in Jesus Christ, the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His suffering, we're not letting ourselves be conformable to his death. Now, things that are conformable are moldable. Moldable. You know, you like Play-Doh, moldable, conformable. You know, my pillow, it's conformable, somewhat. But anyway, you can conform that pillow to the shape of your head, beat it down, and I do all this stuff. And so that my head can lay in it, I can feel comfortable without it going, covering me, and without it lifting me up so much my neck hurts. I might need to check on my pillow. Anyway, all these things, we can be conformable. Did you know we have a way of being conformable? And we have a way of making things around us conformable? And here Christ says, you can, Paul says through Christ, uh, Paul says that Christ is showing us we can be made conformable unto his death. He can conform us. In other words, if we don't think there's any reason or any way you and I can be saved, we're wrong. He can cause us to to be saved if we'll just listen to Him, and He can conform us to be what we need to be, regardless of how bad we think we've been or how lack of talent that we might have. Uh, he, we can be conformable unto His death. That means that we can be like Christ wants us to be. We should have the mind of Christ, God's Word says. And so, if by any means, so can you be conformable? Can you have let yourself have the power that Jesus wants you to have in your life, the strength? That's what Paul said he had to do. He had to realize, you know, I don't have the strength to be what the Lord wants me to do. I have to trust in Him to be conformable. And He will conform me to be able to do and have the strength of the things that He needs me to do. I like that about you. Because every time I try to do things, especially new things, you know how it is when you're older. You like to do things that are similar to what you've been doing before. And new things can throw you for a loop. So when th something new hits you, you have to say, Wow, I need the Lord's help because this doesn't feel comfortable. But God's word says he'll be conforming us unto his death. He, he took the ultimate conforming. He became something completely different than what he really was. He was not a sinner. He was not somebody. He, he was without sin, God's word says. 
He became a sacrifice for you and I who are sinners. And so he became conformable to it. He went to the cross for us. How much conforming can you have to, than to die for other people, right? And so you and I, he helps us to be able to conform uh, just like he conformed to his death and to his death. He can conform us so that we will have a heart to help other people and to do what the Lord wants us to do that we might be a witness. Now, if by any means I, uh, I might attain into the righteousness for the resurrection of the dead. He wanted to attain, Paul said, I wanted to attain unto the righteousness of Christ, the one that died for me, is what he's saying there. Verse 12, not as though I might already attain, <clears throat> either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which I am also, also I am apprehended of Christ. He said, so I don't think I had already, did you ever meet anybody that thought they had already arrived? They had arrived, they had arrived. Okay, we can all start working now. I'm here to start the line to get this thing, all this stuff straightened out. You over here, you're messing up. You over here, you're messing up. Hey, listen, we need to do things the right way. I, they'll call the shots, whether anybody wants them to or not. Have you known a few of those people? Let's see your hands. You know a few people like that? Okay. Let me ask you, are any of you those kind of people? No, I'm just teasing. Uh, but the, the fact is that they're, they're everywhere. They think if, you, you, if you're going to have a party, you can't have it until they arrive. And I just told some of the, the family yesterday, the girls, the daughters, the sisters of Carly, I said, don't have any fun without me. <laughs> Didn't I say that to you? Did I really mean that? Not really. But I didn't want them having fun without me. <laughs> if they're going to have fun, I want to have a little bit of fun too. But anyway, I'm just kind of teasing here, kind of. But anyway, we look at this. We know that Paul was saying, not like I'm already, I, I, don't, I don't think that I've already attained everything I need to be. I'm, I know I'm not perfect, and I know I'm not everything God wants me to be. I'm not even where God wants me to be yet in my life. But I'm moving toward what He wants me to be. I'm not already perfect, but I'm following after that I may, may apprehend. In other words, that I may come to the point to which I have been apprehended for. So listen, you and I, when we're saved, God has a plan for you. He's not, He's apprehended you. He's helped you to see that you need salvation. He's saved you. But He didn't just save you to sit around and do nothing. He saved you because He's got a plan for you. He apprehended you for, uh, for God. You've been apprehended of Jesus Christ. So you could have the mind of Christ. So you could have His motivation. So you could have His strength and His power and His ability to lead you. He doesn't want you to do things your way because you and I both know we will mess it up. You know that? Can you tell me? Can you raise your hand and say, I know that if I do things my way, I have a tendency to mess things up. Let's see your hands. There you go. I'll admit it. Carlene runs around the kitchen all the time, even with her bad hip and everything. She said, just, and she'll say sometimes, just get a frozen sandwich out of the refrigerator, freezer out there, you know? Don't try to make things. Well, I don't like that. You know, that, I know, but she's right. Because I've tried. I burned my hand. I had to go for a week or two weeks uh, getting, pulling that skin off, putting, letting the new skin grow. What do they call that? That term, anyway, there's a term for that. And and then the skillet turned over and the oil fell all over my hand and all over my foot. I burned my foot and my hand at the same time. So I've got my foot in the thing, you know, that whirlpool bath thing, and I've got my hand in it part of the time too. It was a bad thing. But that's what happens when I try to do things my way, my timing. You know, and there's different ways of doing things your way. Maybe you want to do it in your timing. Did you know our timing is not always the best? Yeah, sometimes we'll mess up with the timing. I knew I wanted to marry Carlene. I'm picking on Carlene again. But you know, the timing wasn't what everything I wanted it to be, was it? it? So it has to be in God's time. What about you? Have you tried to do things when it was your time? You want to talk to somebody, but you want to do it at your convenience? You want to tell somebody about the Lord, but you want it to be when it's comfortable and easy for you. 
instead of taking the opportune time that God is showing you, you need to do this now. It's your job. It's something I want you to do. Now, so when he saves us, he saves us, we are apprehended of Christ Jesus. He apprehends us through his salvation. We're apprehended of Christ Jesus because, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Look at verse, the sixth thing that we're talking about that Paul was saying here. This is one thing I do. Wow. If somebody is going to die in the future, and they tell you there's one thing that they do, are you going to listen? Absolutely. This is an important thing right here. If somebody's going to die, your mom and dad, you know, a lot of times people want to know what was the last thing so-and-so said. And sometimes it's not really important. I mean, that all that important might give you a drink of water. I mean, that's not so life-shattering or anything. Or, or, but it, some people say some things that are really important, like, take care of that wife of yours, or take care of that husband. You take care of those kids. Wow, that's the last thing they said. It must have been really important to them that I did what they said. You know, that's what it is. So, this is, he said, but I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Paul is saying, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. How about that? Paul had to be able to forgive himself for all those things that he had been doing in all that time in his life that he had wasted without Jesus Christ. He had to forgive himself of the mistakes he had made. He had to forgive himself for the times that he wasn't listening to what God wanted because he didn't know the Lord. And then sometimes he had to forgive himself for the even when he was saved, during the time he was saved, he had to forgive himself for mistakes he made. Did you know that? Maybe you know the Lord, but there's some things you're not too proud of in your life. Did you know it's okay to ask the Lord for forgiveness and to receive his forgiveness? Quit beating yourself up over it. By the way, if God wants us to give him the things that we've, we've done that were wrong and the mistakes we've made, he, he wants to forgive us of those things. And if he wants to forgive our sins and, and help us to forget, did you know the Lord has to help us forget because we have a way of remembering things that we should not remember. Because it's okay to remember some bad things happen, but it's not good if it prevents us from doing things that God wants us to do. So some bad things might happen in our past, but God's word tells us, like Paul was saying, we, we need to forget those things which are behind. But there's somebody that doesn't want us to forget those things that are behind. The mistakes, the sin, and all that. You may know individuals that keep bringing things up. Who is the source of things that need to be forgotten, but they want to remind us? Who's the source? Somebody tell me. Satan is. If God wants to help us forget those things because they've been forgiven and he wants us to press forward to his mark of a high calling, then who in the world reminds us Satan? And did you know Satan has his workers too? He'll put somebody in your life to remind you about just how bad you were, what you've been, what you couldn't do, how you messed up. Oh yeah, Satan wants to remind you of those things. And he'll have people stationed around in your life to tell you, uh, you know, the last time you tried this, you made a fool of yourself. Last time you did this, you stumbled all over yourself and you looked like an idiot. Yeah, there are people like that. You'll never amount to a hill of beans. Yeah. People have told you that. They'll continue to tell people that. And Satan has his people to tell you things that discourage you. Why? Because he don't want you to be able to move forward. He don't want you to keep trying to do the things that God wants you to do. But Paul had to say, this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. Why? Because if he kept remembering those things which are behind, the, the mistakes of the life he used to live and how imperfect he was, and even the mistakes he had made as he was trying to set up the churches and be a missionary for the Gentile people, if he continued to think about all those mistakes and all the things he had done wrong, He'd never get anything done. We wouldn't move forward at all. Look what Paul said. 
I do, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, I know God thinks, God has some things before me. He has some things before you that He wants you to do. He wants to be in your life. He wants people to be around you that He wants to put there. He wants to be a part, you to be a part of His plan. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for them that love God and are called according to His purpose. He not only loves you, He's not only saved you, He has a purpose for you and a plan that He wants you to follow. Not your plan, His plan. And His plan is the plan we need to follow. Because if we follow our plan, we'll make mistakes. We'll have regrets. We'll mess it up. Why? Because we're human. But with God's help, we're going to do things God's way and it'll work out. All things work together for good for them to love God and call them His purpose. God will make things work out if we're doing things His way, if we're listening to Him. This is one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. God has a lot before you. In this new year, God has a lot to offer you and a lot for you to receive. Blessings, good things He wants to do for you. He loves His people. Remember, God is love. James 1.17, all good and perfect gifts come from the Father of lights, from above, and who is no variableness for shadow of turning. God's not going to change His character. He wants good and perfect things to go on in your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to help you. Won't you let Him? Let's let the Lord help us in this new year. Let's not do things our way. We know what happened that way. Let's not try to do our own thing because it's going to be our own thing and it's not that great. But when God gets a hold of us and helps us to press toward the mark, verse 14, mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, things can work out. Paul said, I've realized I've got to forget those things, put them behind me, and press toward the mark of the things that God wants us. He has some marks for you and I. Some marks that He wants to show us that we need to achieve. He has things for you to achieve and do in your life that would be fulfilling His plan for you. Did you know that? I press the word the mark for the prize. And it's something you're, not only are you going to have a prize in heaven for doing the, re reaching those marks, you're going to have a prize right here. He blesses us as we do things His way. He has a way of working all things out for good for us as we do things His way and reach toward the mark of the, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's no higher calling for you in this whole world. Not the lottery, not winning something or anything else, not being the first person at work that, that gets there and gets everything. No, you know, all that stuff is manly, you know, praise of men. But now, now we're looking at this. The best thing you and I can have in this life is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus in our lives. He has a high call for you. Just think of it this way. Of all the people at work, He's got a high call for you in your life. Some very, very, very valuable, important things He wants you to do at work and in your family. He wants you to make a difference through Him and He can help you do it. In a wonderful way, not a proud way, not a degrading way. You're going to make somebody else feel bad about you. No, he'll show you how to do it his way, and he will cause you to be conformed. In other words, he'll help you to know how to do it his way. He will conform you, you and I, to know, wait a minute, how am I going to do it? He'll help you know. He'll help you know what to do, how to do it, and the right time. As you press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if any, if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So he says, if, you, if you're not getting this right now, if you're not understanding right now that there might be problems in your life, give God a chance here to show you. He will reveal it to you. I've gone down at the altar and I've come to fall. Lord, I'm doing all the things you need me to do. I'm not happy, Lord, you know, the things are working out in my life, family and church and all that. And, you know, if, if there's anything you can show me that I need to do, he says, matter of fact, there's something I'd like to show you that you might need to be working on. If you ask the Lord, he's good enough to us to show us what our problems might be or things that we might need to work on. 
Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if any in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Okay, let's stop right there. We'll come to a close. Let's stand now for just a moment, and we'll sing a, a verse of Just As I Am. And we'll give you the opportunity to make decisions in your life. speak to us. Did you know God, you wonder how God does that, right? Did you know the angels are the messengers of God? Did you know that? He has his angels taking charge of our lives. Did you know that? They're around us to protect us. I know some of you, I know you need God's protection. Some of you, I mean, you've been pushing the envelope anyway, some of you have. You need God's help to protect you, to keep you safe, to keep you healthy. God needs you. To be safe. He wants you to be safe, but he'll use his angels to protect you. By the way, he'll put other people in your life, to put people in your life too, to help you. Let, let people help you. Let God's people help you. Okay, let's look at this, just as I am. Oh, I was going to say angels, God's messengers. Did you know God's messengers, the angels, God uses them to share his word, to help move people, to, to work in the churches. It talks about the angels of the church, you know. So listen, God's, God can be present in our church services with the angels, with His help uh, of going on, going on. And you'll notice the Holy Spirit might be calling you and working on you right now, showing you some things that you need to do. Here we go, page 187. Just as I am without one Please don't fail to acknowledge 
to God that you want his help. That's the beginning of getting God's help is acknowledging first that you know you need it. Anybody else? See, you need his help. All right. Thank you so much for uh, the blessing of having me here today. And we're thankful for each person that's come and those on live stream that's been helping us too by watching and, and uh, listening to God's word. And now, dear Heavenly Father, we pray for these whose hands have been raised. They're admitting before you, Lord, that they just want things to go your way. There may be things that we're not proud of and things that we're trying to overcome. But Father, we just pray that you'd help all those that have raised their hands, each one of us in our own hearts, to declare, Lord, that we know we want to reach your mark in our lives and your high calling. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us admit that we need help in whatever way we're being bothered. And there are things that will bother us and regrets that we might have. Help us forgive ourselves, Lord. You forgive us. Why shouldn't we forgive ourselves? We should. Your word says we should. And move forward. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, we're thankful for you to be here today. And remember now, New Year's Eve service is going to be at 9, 9 to 12. And we'll have a circle of prayer welcoming the new year in. So at midnight, we'll do that. And it'll take probably about four or five minutes to pray together. And we'll do that, and then uh, we will we will have snacks too uh, from nine to twelve. Snacks and a movie. So you just uh, be willing, uh, if you will, to be with us and get off the roads and be in a good place, right? There were times when some of you, and I won't mention any names, when you were lost, might have been other places on New Year's Eve that might not have been so savory, right? I'm not going to But you know who you are. So I'm just saying, you know what? No regrets. Let God help you to forgive yourself. Move forward. And come to some good things. Be together with God's people. Now we'll be closing. And anybody got anything to share before we go home? Anybody? Jim, it's good to have you and Linda and Velma here with us today. It's such a blessing to see you. And Steve, you have your hand up? Or March? Ties. Yes. If you have ties, Carly, would you write our ties out for us and with the check and write it out? And uh, and then uh, anybody else has ties, uh, you, would you go ahead and put them in? And Terry, if you'll come on up and get one of the offering plates. And Steve, if you'll come up and get the other one. No, I'm not, not, you don't mind. I'm not you, Jim. Jim, would you get this offering plate here since he's not here that often? Come on up, Jim. If you don't mind, get the offering plate. And if you will, uh, send those through the aisles and, and we'll take a, our tithes and offerings. And Terry rejects the blessing on that offering. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you as we come near the end of a new year that we are starting a new, another new year. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that uh, you would uh, touch our hearts, help us to be cheerful givers. Yes, Father. Even in our challenging times, Father, we know that you are always there for us, watching over us. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the givers today and that you would bless uh, all that comes forward to go for your glory, for your kingdom. All this is Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. If you'll take up that, those tithes and offerings now.